What up, though? Adam online. The etymology of words dictionary online, the online version. Alabama created and named as a U.S. territory 1817 by a division of Mississippi Territory. Ultimately named for one of the native peoples who live there, who speak Muscogean. Their name probably is from a Choctaw term meaning plant cutters. Related, Alabamian. Rosa Parks, My Story by Rosa Parks with Jim Haskins. This book is dedicated to the memory of my mother, Leona McCauley, and my husband, Raymond A. Parks. One evening in early December 1955, I was sitting in the front seat of the colored section of a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. The white people were sitting in the white section. More white people got on and they filled up all the seats in the white section. When that happened, we black people were supposed to give up our seats to the whites, but I didn't move. The white driver said, let me have those front seats. I didn't get up. I was tired of giving in to white people. I didn't get up. I was tired of giving in to white people. I'm going to have you arrested, the driver said. You may do that, I answered. Two white policemen came. I asked one of them, why do you all push us around? He answered, I don't know, but the law is the law and you're under arrest. <clears throat> For half of my life, there were laws and customs in the South that kept African Americans segregated from Caucasians. I'm curious as to why Miss Rosa Parks used the term African Americans to describe herself during that time. For half of my life, there were laws and customs in the South that kept African Americans segregated from Caucasians. It was very hard. See, she went, um, she says African Americans, but then she says Caucasians. Not whites, but she said Caucasians this time. She went to the root of what those so those people were, but she didn't go to the root of who she is and who her family is. It was very hard to do anything about segregation and racism when white people had the power of the law behind them. Somehow we had to change the laws and we had to get enough white people on our side to be able to succeed. I had no idea when I refused to give up my seat on that Montgomery bus that my small action would help put an end to the segregation laws in the South. I only knew that I was tired of being pushed around. I was a regular person, just as good as anybody else. There had been a few times in my life when I had been treated by white people like a regular person, so I knew what that felt like. I'm also curious as to know why people um, during that time, um, Americans, people who look like you and me, why they complained about the way the buses were segregated as well as other things instead of creating their own bus line. Let's shake it. One of my earliest memories of childhood is, was right after World War I, around 1919. 
I was five or six years old. Moses Hudson, the owner of the plantation next to our land in Pine Level, Alabama, came out from the city, came out from the city. She says, one of my earliest memories was right after World War I, around 1919, when I was five or six years old. Moses Hudson, the owner of the plantation next, next to our land in Pine Level, Alabama. Next to our land. Let's cut to the Century Foundation. Is the fight for school integration still worthwhile for African Americans? TCF.org. Quietly and subtly, the opponents of integration have won. So at least it seems, judging by virtually every indicator of American public education, from test scores to social outcomes. Rutger Johnson, 2019. In 1969, black America was all in on integration. At the time, 80% of black Americans surveyed say they wanted their children to attend school with white children. 83% preferred to work in mixed settings at their job. 75% preferred to live in mixed neighborhoods and 78% believed black people would be better off through integration. Black Americans' reservations about the potential adverse effects of integration were quite muted. Only 5% of respondents said they thought black students would do worse if they attended school with white children. In her research on black youth, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum found that the opportunity for same-race peer relationships the opportunity to gain new information about African-American heritage and accomplishments, the availability of role models, and the encouragement of significant adults were reported as important components in these students' successes and in their resolution of racial identity issues. Positive, strong, all-black spaces are key to success for African-Americans, and especially for African-American children, a factor that black Americans have known for a long time. <clears throat> if there are not adequate Negro schools in Florida and there is some residual, some inherent and unchangeable quality in white schools impossible to duplicate anywhere else, then I am the first to insist that Negro children of Florida be allowed to share this boon. But if there are adequate Negro schools and prepared instructors and prepared instructors and instructions, then there is nothing different except the presence of white people. Zora Neale Hurston, 1955. We are not going to comply with the Supreme Court decision of putting whites and blacks together, but the least, but, but the least we advertise that fact, the better. John C. Stennis, U.S. Senator from Mississippi, 1954. One key feature distinguishing many of the institutions that support black excellence in academic, social, and other endeavors from segregated spaces is the element of agency. For millions of black families who reside in segregated neighborhoods or attend segregated schools, there are myriad structural forces at play that conspire to limit their choices to just one, effectively eliminating any element of agency whatsoever. The most consequential feature of black segregated schools in the United States is that they are mostly high poverty schools. Professor Rutger Johnson of the University of California, Berkeley, showed that the enactment of desegregation orders in the 1960s and 1970s led to an immediate average increase in per pupil education spending dollars of 22.5% for black children. 
relying on state governments to make black Americans whole has never been a winning formula. The inexperienced white teacher assigned to teach in the all black school has become so common over the past few decades that it is a Hollywood trope. Zora Neale Hurston, a literary genius of the early of 20th, early 20th century, who had out of the black mainstream political beliefs and whose, quote, opened this section, argued vociferously against integration in a 1955 op-ed in the Orlando Sentinel, believing that the desire for integration stemmed from a romanticizing of proximity to white people rather than genuine improvement. Remarking on the state of affairs of segregated black education in her state of Florida, she wrote, Negro schools in the state are in very good shape and on the improve. We are fortunate in having Dr. D.E. Williams as head and driving force of Negro instruction. Dr. Williams is relentless in his drive to improve both physical equipment and teacher quality. A child cannot be taught by anyone whose demand essentially is that the child repudiate his experience and experience and all that gives him sustenance and enter a limbo in which he will no longer be black and in which he knows that he can never become white. Black people have lost too much, too many black children that way. James Baldwin, 1979. Benjamin Banneker High School, one of the best high schools, not only in Washington, D.C., but one of the best high schools in the country, has been recognized as a national blue ribbon school, one of America's best public schools by U.S. News and World Report, and the top high school in Washington, D.C., a Washington Post profile from the 90s called Banneker, a school of miracles. Banneker is mostly black. Last year, only 2% of Banneker students identified as white. Banneker combines its outstanding academic record with palpably high standards in everything it does. Principal Berger told me, we don't have any discipline issues here. Desegregation is eliminative eliminative and negative, for it simply removes these legal and social prohibitions. Integration is creative and is therefore more profound and far-reaching than desegregation. Integration is genuine, intergroup, interpersonal doing. Integration is the ultimate goal of our national community. Martin Luther King Jr., 1962. It has been well documented that many African-American teachers and principals were fired as districts desegregated, especially in the South. When schools were closed as part of the desegregation effort, it was almost always black schools that were closed. Two researchers calculated that 31,584 teaching positions occupied by black teachers were lost between 1954 and 1972 due to desegregation, denying countless children critical role models and mentors. Black students were, at best, exposed to a curriculum that omitted them and the contributions of their forebearers from the curriculum. TeachingAmericanHistory.org Letter to the Orlando Sentinel Zora Neale Hurston August 11, 1955 
I was not going to part my lips concerning the U.S. Supreme Court decision on ending segregation in the public schools of the South. Consider me as just thinking out loud. If there are not adequate Negro schools in Florida and there is some residual, some inherent and unchangeable quality in white schools, impossible to duplicate anywhere else, then I am first to insist that Negro children of Florida be allowed to share this boon. But if there are adequate Negro schools and prepared instructors and instructions, then there is nothing different except the presence of white people. I regard the ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court as insulting. Since the days of the never-to-be-sufficiently-deplored Reconstruction, there has been current the belief that there is no greater delight to Negroes than physical association with whites. But the South had better beware in another direction. While it is being frantic over the segregation ruling, it had better keep its eyes open for more important things. One instance of government by fiat has been rammed down its throat. It is possible that the end of segregation is not here and never meant to be here at present. But the attention of the South directed on what was calculated to keep us busy while more ominous things were brought to pass. The stubborn South and the Midwest kept this nation from being dragged farther to the left than it was during the New Deal. <clears throat> the Supreme Court would have pleased me more if they had concerned themselves about enforcing the compulsory education provisions for Negroes in the South as is done for white children. The next 10 years would be better spent in appointing truant officers and looking after conditions in the homes from which the children came. Back to Rosa Parks, my story. Montgomery to visit and stop by the house. Moses Hudson had his son-in-law with him, a soldier from the north. They stopped in to visit my family. We southerners called all northerners Yankees in those days. The Yankee soldier patted me on the head and said, I was such a cute little girl. Later that evening, my father talked about how the Yankee soldier had treated me like I was just another little girl, not a little black girl, because you weren't a little black girl. Rosa Parks' birthplace in Tuskegee, Alabama. Rosa Parks' birthplace in Tuskegee, Alabama. We have a map of Alabama. And as you can see, Tuskegee, I believe it's in Macon County. Tuskegee. A portion of my family, my ancestors were born, uh, actually a large portion was born in Tuskegee, Alabama. I was raised in my grandparents' house in Pine Level in Montgomery County near Montgomery, Alabama. All my mother's people came from Pine Level. My mother's name was Leona Edwards. Rosa's mother, Leona Edwards, seated, and Leona Edwards, Rosa mother, Rosa's mother's cousin, Beatrice, is standing. So, Rosa Parks, Rosa McCauley, her mother is seated. 
all my mother's people came from Pine Level. My mother's name was Leona Edwards. My father's name was, my father came from Abbeville, Alabama. His name was James McCauley. He was a carpenter and a builder, very skilled at brick and stone masonry. He traveled all around building houses. My father's brother-in-law, Reverend Dominic, Auntie Addie's husband, was pastor of the Mount Zion African Methodist Episcopal Church. That's a mouthful. In Pine Level. And it was there in Pine Level that my father met my mother, who was a teacher. They were married right there in Pine Level on April 12, 1912. Pictured here is Rosa's father, James McCauley, 1923. After they were married, they moved to Tuskegee, Alabama to live. It was the home of Tuskegee Institute. My parents lived not far from it. Both black and white leaders called the town of Tuskegee a model of good race relations. There were a lot of buildings. There were a lot of building jobs in the, con in the county of Macon, Alabama. My mother got a job teaching. I was born on February 4th, 1913 in Tuskegee and named Rosa after my maternal grandmother, Rose. My mother always said that she was unprepared to be a mother. I guess she was unhappy because my father worked on building homes in different places in the country and she was left alone quite a bit. At that time, women who were pregnant didn't get out and move around and socialize like they do now. They stayed pretty much to themselves. I was a sickly child small for my age. My uncle Robert was a carpenter too, and he enrolled at Tuskegee Institute to take courses in carpentry and building. But my mother always said uncle Robert knew so much about what they were trying to teach him that he was teaching the instructors. He didn't stay at Tuskegee Institute very long as a student. I have pictures of the houses my father and uncle built, beautiful homes, beautiful houses. They learned from their father. They didn't learn anything at Tuskegee. But Tuskegee was still the best place in Alabama for African Americans to get an education. And my mother wanted to stay there. But Tuskegee was still the best place in Alabama for African Americans. How much clearer would the picture be if she actually called herself what her family had called themselves for generations? We know that the term African-American was likely not used at that time. So it would help quite a bit if Miss Parks would use the name or designation that her family used or that the generations before used or simply just her name. African-Americans, black is very misleading and very confusing. At this point, even frustrating, let's shake it. My father decided he didn't want me, didn't want to remain in Tuskegee. He wanted to go back to his family in Abbeville. My mother had no choice but to go with him. So we went to Abbeville to live with my father's family. It was a big family with lots of children. My grandmother had started having children early and didn't stop for a long time. When did she start having children? When I was born, my father's youngest brother, George Gaines McCauley, was eight years old. When I was born, my father's youngest brother, George Gaines McCauley, was eight years old. Hmm. 
I learned all I know about my father's family from my young uncle George. He said that my father's grandfather was unknown, was unknown. And someone said he was one of the Yankee soldiers who served in the South during the Civil War. My father's grandmother was a slave girl and part Indian. <clears throat> my father's grandmother was a slave girl and part Indian or something. <laughs> see how she just brushed that off? You see how it, 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 it reminds me of, of when I was, when I was a, a, a small child and you, you'd often hear people say, um, you look like you got Indian in your family or you got Indian in your family or someone would say, I got Indian in my family. But it was it was a fleeting statement. It, it really it, it wasn't said. It, it wasn't solid. It wasn't backed by anything. No one cared to back it by anything. No one cared to dig into it. My father's grandmother was a slave girl. What does that mean? A slave girl. A girl who worked. Like most people did. Why didn't she describe her father as a slave as he built houses? My father decided to go north and my mother didn't want to stay with his family while he was gone. She was pregnant with my brother by then and she decided to go back to live with her own parents who had a small farm in Pine Level. My mother took me to live with her parents in Pine Level, Alabama when I was a toddler. Later, my father joined us and we lived as a family until I was two and a half years old. He left Pine Level to find work and I did not see him again until I was five years old. I was two and a half years old. My father joined us and we lived as a family until I was two and a half years old. He left Pine Level to find work and I did not see him again until I was five years old and my brother was three. He stayed several days and left again. I did not see my father anymore until I was an adult and married. This is a picture of Rosa's mother, Leona, and James McCauley with their daughter, Rosa, Rosa Louise. In 1914, Rosa was 18 months old. My mother and father never got back together. They just couldn't coordinate their lives together because he wanted to travel and she wanted to be situated in a permanent house. This is Rose's interpretation of the issues that her mother and father were having. Um, I'll go out on a limb and say that as a child, she had no idea. I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot more about my mother's family history. My great grandfather was my grandmother's father. My great grandfather, my grandmother's father, had the last name of Percival. As a young Scotch Irish boy, he had been brought to the United States on a ship. He was white, but he wasn't free. Over in Europe, poor white people were sometimes indentured servants. They signed an agreement that in return for their fare to America, they would work for someone for a particular number of years. During those years, they had no rights. My great grandfather arrived in this country through the port of Charleston, South Carolina. He married Mary Jane Nobles.
my great grandfather arrived in this country through the port of Charleston, South Carolina. My great grandfather, my grandmother's father, had the last name of Percival. As a young Scotch Irish boy, he had been brought to the United States on a ship. He was white, but he wasn't free. My great grandfather, Percival, arrived in this country through the port of Charleston, South Carolina. Remember that. So, this is Ancestry.com. We're going to go to Rosa McCauley. We're going to go to Rosa Parks, the 1920 census. She was six years old. She was born in Alabama. Home in 1920, Pine Level, Montgomery, Alabama. Race, mulatto. Which at this point, which at this point in the game, It's clear that this word has nothing to do with whether a so-called pink or gray person and a so-called black person had offspring. This mulatto seems to be synonymous with uh, Indian. Rosa's relationship to the head of the household. She is the granddaughter. Father's birthplace, Alabama. Mother's birthplace, Alabama. Attended school, yes. So as we can see here, it says Sylvester Edwards, 62, Rosa's grand grandfather. Rosie is 58. Rosie is 58. Hold on, let me go down and explain it. So, the 1920 census. Remember, Percival was Scotch-Irish, came over from the port, through the port, came over on a ship through the port of South Carolina. Okay. So, Alabama, 14th census, 1920. This is who's in the household, Sylvester Edwards, Rosa's grandfather, her mother's father, head of the household, mulatto, 62 years old, married, can read and write, born in Alabama. This is the information from the actual census sheet. The access sent the actual census sheet. I didn't put it on here because the words it, it was just too tiny. Um, Sylvester Edwards, Rosa's grandfather, her mother's father, head of the household, mulatto, 62, married, can read and write, born in Alabama. He owns the home he lives in. Father's birthplace is Georgia. Mother's birthplace is Georgia. He's able to speak English. His occupation is farmer on his own general farm. He's an employer. <clears throat> I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not adding or subtracting. This is exactly what's on the census. Rosie Edwards, Rosa's grandmother, her mother's mother. So Rosa, Rosie, um, so uh, Rosa is living with, she's in the house of her mother's mother and her mother's father. Rosie Edwards, Rosa's grandmother, who she was named after. Her mother's mother, wife of head of the household, mulatto is what she is, 58. She can read and write, born in Alabama. Her father was born in South Carolina, born in South Carolina. Her mother was born in Georgia. She's able to speak English. She's a farm laborer, a farm worker, a farm slave as occupation on her general farm. living life. Leona McCauley, Rosa's mother. She's in 1920. She's in the house with her parents. Remember, she didn't want to go. She didn't want to live with Rosa's father's uh, family. So she went back to live with be with her own family. 
Leona McCauley, Rosa's mother, daughter. She's the daughter of the head of the household. She's mulatto, 27, divorced. She can read and write, born in Alabama, mother and father born in Alabama. She's able to speak English. Her occupation is teacher at a public school and is a wage earner. Here we have James Percival, who we were just speaking of, Scotch, Irish, who came over, who Rosa later in life, later in life when she was writing this autobiography, later in life, she said her father came, her, her uh, great grandfather came over on a boat. He was a Scotch Irish. He was a Scotch Irish who came over on a boat in the port of South Carolina. James Percival, Rosa's great grandfather. Rosa was living in the house with her grandparents and her great grandfather, her grandmother's father. So it's her grandmother, Rosie's father. Now. Rosie is, a, is considered mulatto. So is her husband considered mulatto. So is everyone in the house considered mulatto. But it says James Percival is a Scotch Irish is what is what Rosa said when she was putting together this autobiography. James Percival, Rosa's great grandfather, her grandmother's father, father in law of the head of the household. He's. Sylvester's father-in-law. He's mulatto, 90 years old, widowed, cannot read or write. And this is what it says on the actual census. Born in South Carolina. Mother and father born in America. He's able to speak English. It didn't say where his mother and father were born, but it said they were born in America. Rosa said that he came over on a boat and he was Scotch Irish and came over on a boat. However, the census record said that he was born in South Carolina. Mother and father born in America. He's able to speak English. Did she just not remember? Was she lying? On purpose? Again, did she just not remember? And if she's writing a book, an autobiography, and you know, she is like the mother of the civil rights movement. So I think there would, be, would have been someone to actually help her find this information. I can find I can find it. And it's not like some tedious thing. It's not difficult. It wasn't difficult. In order to be accurate, why wouldn't she look at these census records? Again, is she lying on purpose? And why? Let's shake it. Rosa McCauley. This is Rosa Parks. Rosa McCauley. McCauley, her maiden name. Granddaughter of the head of the household, the head of the household, Sylvester, remember, Rosa calls herself African-American, says African-American people. She also says black people. We've heard it. I just we, we went through the beginning of her autobiography. But here it says mulatto. She's six years old, born in Alabama, mother and father born in Alabama. Sylvester McCauley, Rosa's little brother, um, named after his granddad. Grandson of the head of the household, mulatto, four years old, born in Alabama, mother and father born in Alabama. 
I'm not sure who Rose's father is. Well, yeah, I am sure. Rose's father is Parks. Rose's father is Parks. He's not there. They didn't. She went his her mother, Leona, went to live with her parents. But why would Rosa say that her Percival, her great grandfather, was Scotch Irish and he came over on a boat and she went through the whole spiel of indentured servitude. And he came over on a boat through the port of South Carolina. Did she just not remember? A photo that has been passed down for several generations in Rosa's family, identified as Mary Jane and James Percival. Mary James, it said James Percival on the 1920 census. Remember, it said that he was widowed. That he was a widower, a widow. He was widowed was his marital status. And this is his late wife, Mary Jane. Identified as Mary Jane and James Percival. That's James Percival. Says born in South Carolina. You think he didn't know where he was born? You think Rosa knows where that that he was that he came over on a boat through the port of South Carolina and he didn't? Hmm. As we go through this six part series, should be very interesting. Do the right thing. 